Hey everybody, my name is Shane Fernandez, uh, the founder and venture attorney at Junto Law. Um, I'm excited to present to you guys today on a, an interesting topic. Uh, it's called Seed to Scale, what you need to know about building a team, culture, and company. And generally what we're going to talk about today is you know, bringing on co-founders, hiring employees, uh, granting equity to employees, service providers, advisors, and things like that. Um, there's a there's a few different kind of ways to uh, to look at this, and you know we're we're in an international scope, but this is very U.S. Uh, centric. Uh, if we w did every jurisdiction, we'd be here for about ten hours. So um, this is going to be kind of U.S. based, but a lot of the principles kind of apply in other jurisdictions as well. So just an overview, we're going to talk about. So the first thing that we're going to try to talk about is, is every business is solving a problem, right? That's kind of how everything kind of jumps out, right? Is what is the problem you're solving? And so we often try to think about uh, the various concepts that I'm going to talk about today within the context of solving a problem. And so, you know, as a, a parent of, of two little girls you want, and running a business, one of the things that's difficult is just finding time for laundry, right? being able to kind of take that off my plate. Uh, and so I'm, I'm assuming other people have this problem. So maybe I have an idea of ways of solving this problem. So one way of solving this problem might be, you know, a simple website um, where called, you know, laundry map where somebody can find out the cheapest prices uh, for laundry, the availability, you know, how quick the turnaround times are and things like that. And I would think about this company as, you know, being pretty static website with low operating costs, um, you're going to have some advertising revenue is going to be your, your general source of revenue there. It's very bootstrappable, right? I think I made that word up. Uh, but basically, it means like as long as you know how to kind of do the code or can hire somebody to do the code and build the website, there's not a ton of maintenance or really marketing there, right? There's some SEO that's kind of built in that you're going to need to have and capture, but there's not this huge degree of investment dollars that's going to go in here. And so usually in the U.S., companies organize this type of business as an LLC or maybe even an S Corp. And so that's important for a few reasons we're going to talk about today. Um, and we're talking about an LLC, we're talking about things like membership interests. You're a member of the LLC, you're an owner of the LLC, um, and another concept called profits interests. And we'll talk about this more today. And uh, But the, the main focus is going to be on this latter type of company, uh, and most of the examples will be around this latter type of company, but I will also give you um, a referral back to companies that are more of an LLC-centric uh, type of situation. The second company is called WeWash, right? So I'm going to create a two-sided marketplace, kind of like Uber, um, where basically people who have uh, laundry machines can you know, go on the app as a service provider, and they can say, and then other people who need laundry done can you know be on the other side of that marketplace and they can say hey come pick up my laundry i've got the whites i've got the colors and come pick them up and drop them off and so this type of company you know it's going to require a lot more marketing it's going to require substantial more investment because you have to create two sides of a marketplace you're not satisfying a simple one side marketplace um and, and for this type of business, you're usually looking at a, a business that would be we call a venture backed business, somebody that's going to need some investment capital from outsider from outsiders. And usually, this is a C corp, and the equity you're talking about is stock, and you're talking about restricted stock and stock options or what you're going to be granting out. And so, you could think of stock and membership interests as very similar, and options and profits interests as very similar. So. Let's go for it. Okay, so the first kind of, with those two things in mind, we're, we're going to think about co-founders, right? So co-founders are usually the individuals that come out of the earliest stages of the business, right? Often they have complementary skills, right? You're not going to have two tech-focused uh, co-founders and no one who's really business-minded, marketing-minded, operational-minded. You're going to have some folks that can wear um, hats that are complementary of each other. Often at this stage, you know, it's a very, very early stage, potentially at the time that you actually form the company or a short time after, um, you're going to give out equity that is corresponds with the level of commitment someone has, right? If, if somebody's doing this, uh, you know, as a moonlighting project and they're not going to quit their full-time job, they're not going to dedicate everything to this right away, but somebody else is, then usually equity accounts for that, right? You need to be thinking about not only the value that someone's skill set offers, but the their time commitment, right? 
Um, also, these what, these founders usually receive something called founder shares, as we like to call them, right? They are basically stock or membership interest that is subject to this uh, concept called vesting, which I'll go over next. Um, another key part of bringing on a co-founder is agreeing that, uh, you know, one, to transfer all IP over to the company, right? If you're building a software product, then that code is IP. It's, you know, it's generally covered by copyright. Uh, if you're building logos, that's a trademark. If you're building some process or, you know, hard um, technology, that could be patentable. And so, you know, a potential buyer of your business uh, like an acquirer or an investor is going to expect that the company is the one that owns that and not an individual because it can be very difficult to track that down. Co-founders often also sign, you know, confidentiality agreements not to disclose uh, things to competitors and also restrictive covenants, which we'll go over next, which are basically known as non-competes or non-solicitation provisions. So let's go over, so that's generally the concept, right? So let's, let's go over this concept of vesting. You've, um, given out stock to a, a co-founder. Um, and so, but this is subject to vesting. Vesting is the concept that allows the company to repurchase the shares at the price, either the, usually it's the lesser of the price that the founder paid for the shares or fair market value at the time that they leave, right? And so the idea here is that the company can repurchase these shares back, buy back that equity at a very, very low price if the founder leaves the company early. And um, what early means is basically before the stock is fully vested, right? So vesting is most often tied to a timing, right? So you're working and providing services for the company uh, for a certain period of time. The most common measurement there is a, what we call a four-year vesting schedule with a one-year cliff, right? So the stock is gonna vest over four years, the one year cliff is, it just means that it's the initial hurdle. So for instance, in one year, the founder needs to stay with the company for at least one year, and then 25% of it vests, meaning 25% of the stock, you know, once it vests cannot be repurchased by the company at that low price. They get to keep it essentially. And there's some carve outs here for that. But vesting can also be tied to meeting certain goals, right? Getting $2 million in ARR, um, you know, achieving some certain technical milestones, things like that. You usually see that much more with contractors or advisors that are coming on in a limited capacity, right? They're not providing the the day-to-day -day operational support that would be applicable to time, right? It's more of meeting specific goals. Uh, and you can mix and match these. I think it just makes it much more difficult. I think, you know, goal-oriented approach needs to be very specific or else people will argue about, about whether or not it was their fault for not meeting the goals and the goals change and things like that. It's just, it's just much more uh, difficult to tell. Uh, whereas time, you know, you can tell, hey, you know, we're no longer going to work with you anymore uh, in an email. It's pretty easy to track the, the dates. Um, so what does vesting do? It, it basically incentivizes the founders to stay together throughout the entire vesting period, right? So without vesting, one founder, uh, both of you have two founders, right? And one of them decides to leave six months in. If he gets, he or she gets to keep all of her equity, why would I continue to build? Like if I'm building WeWash and my co-founder leaves six months earlier and he, he or she's going to own 50% of the company, why would I keep building it? I'm basically building it uh, with something that they're going to receive a windfall on, right? If I build it, it gets huge, makes a ton of money, or we sell it, they're going to get half of that. So vesting, make sure that everybody's incentivized to keep building the company and not just leaving early. So vesting has some exceptions, right? Um, so let's say you, your co-founder, you know, Vest, he's been there for four years, he or she's been there for four years, but then you find out that they've actually been like funneling clients to their own particular company that's offering competing service, or they have been working with a competitor and disclosing, you know, key IP or proprietary information to that competitor in exchange for cash. Well, obviously we're not going to let them continue to be a, a, an owner of the business. So they've engaged in some type of damaging conduct. Um, or they're terminated for cause. In that case, 
you would usually be able to say that the founder forfeits their vesting. And you would put that in their initial stock grant or membership interest grant saying that if you do these types of things, it doesn't matter if you're vested, the company's not going to pay you out. You're going to get, you're going to forfeit your stock because you've engaged in conduct that is clearly detrimental to the company. On the other side of that, what happens if my co-founder and I have been building this for one year on a four-year vesting schedule and it just blows up and somebody offers us a billion dollars for it? Do we, and there's some like investors that are involved too, are we no longer entitled to have 100% of our stock that we received? Does the company get to repurchase that back because it's, you know, the company's selling before the vesting schedule? No. What happens there is this is what we call an acceleration of vesting. And in the agreement, there are two different flavors of acceleration. You could have single trigger acceleration, which means once we agree to sell the company to the acquirer, that's all that needs to happen for 100% of our shares to vest. Or you could have du double trigger, which is a much more kind of, um, you would normally see this for employees that might receive restricted stock or stock subject to vesting. Um, or venture capitalists might want the shares of the founders to be subject to double trigger because the, the first trigger is only sale, but then also a second trigger has to be met. The founder has to be terminated by the acquirer for some period of time. This is the concept of rest invest. If you remember the show Silicon Valley where Big Head gets acquired by uh, I forget what the company's called, but it's basically supposed to be Google, right? And then he just rests and vests and hangs out and drinks soda and beer all day uh, and does nothing. And so that's the concept of double trigger acceleration. You don't vest unless you're terminated uh, early, basically. You need to stay with the company. Um, and this is much more, this is what an acquirer is going to want you to do, right? They're going to want to say, I'm buying the team too, and the team needs to stay on throughout this transition period until they're fully vested to get the full amount of their stock and the cash that they are supposed to get on an acquisition. So a lot of times, depending if you have sub single trigger or double trigger, there's a little bit of leverage that the acquirer has, right? So arguably, if you have double trigger, your company's value uh, is a little bit higher. And if I'm a buyer, I might be willing to pay a little bit more knowing that the that the founders are gonna have to stay on with the business for a certain period of time and to fully vest in order to fully vest. Um, and so I might pay a little bit of a premium there. Um, another note is venture back founders are often asked to reset their vesting schedules, right? So this kind of makes sense if you put your your investor hat on and a company's been going around for you know three years, the founders are almost completely vested. Um, you don't want to get in a situation where um, you make your investment and then six months later, the founders have you know, 80, 90% of their shares vested and they're like, eh, we're done. We don't really care. You can hire a new CEO to take this over and we'll get all of our equity and we own, you know, 60% of the company, 70% of the company. We don't care. You get us, you get us to exit. And so often investors will say that founders need to reset their vesting schedules and maybe say that they have three more years of vesting or two more years of vesting and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and so that's a concept of vesting. What can be difficult when you're talking about the LLC situation when we're talking about vesting is that LLCs for a general statement, if you have at least two owners of an LLC or an S Corp, those, the actual entity itself, the LLC, doesn't pay taxes. The tax obligations flow through to the owners in accordance with their ownership interest, right? Their ownership percentage. So if I owned an LLC 50 50 with a partner, then, and we made a million dollars in profit. The LLC is not going to pay any taxes, but I'm going to be obligated to pay, you know, the equivalent of five hundred thousand dollars, you know, of income. The taxes I'm going to have to pay five hundred thousand in taxes, um, but I'm going to have to pay taxes based on having received or being allocated five hundred thousand dollars. And the same thing with my co-founder. Similarly, if we had losses of a million dollars, I would be able to allocate the five hundred thousand in losses and things like that. That is not the case with corporations. Corporations, unless it's an S corp, a C corp pays its own taxes. Okay, so it pays its own taxes at its own tax rate. And so I bring this up with vesting. There is you just need to be very careful on what the vesting says and what the grant of the membership interest says as it comes to vesting, because you know if you if a 
founder basically um, leaves early and then the company repurchases them from 50% to now that they only own 20%, you know, what is the tax allocation or the tax obligation? When is the the stopping time and how do you kind of account for that? So it's it's kind of an accounting hurdle. So it's something that's kind of unique to LLCs and S Corps and other entities that are taxed as partnerships uh, or disregarded entities. Okay. This is something that's going to seem incredibly boring, but it's actually probably one of the most important things that you can think of as a founder in the event that you're successful. If you're not successful, this probably doesn't matter that much, but everybody wants to be successful. So this is something that I would definitely listen to. When founders receive stock that is subject to vesting, they often file an 83B election with the IRS, okay? This is either founders that are operating... Uh, in the U.S., or they have a U.S.-based entity, or otherwise subject to tax treatment in the U.S. So an 83B election tells the IRS that the founder wants to be taxed on the value of their shares when they received it, okay? The election must be filed in 30 days, and if you fail to do so, it could have significant consequences. Why would I want to be taxed at the time that my stock is received? Well, Generally speaking, if you're starting a corporation or maybe even an LLC, your company's going to have no value. You don't have any cash in the bank or significant cash in the bank. You have no customers. You have no IP. You have no assets. Your company's worth essentially nothing. So whenever we form a brand new startup as a Delaware corporation, we say that the value of the founder shares is zero dollars zero 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 one so it's a fraction of a penny right and we might grant each founder a million shares of stock and at the end of the day that's like the equivalent of like a dollar right and so the 83b election um, comes in and it's really helpful to say i want to be taxed now because if you don't do that then the irs will say your stock is subject to being taxed when it vests so if, uh, for instance, here's an example, right? I've received my shares um, for a fraction of a penny. And then two years later, let's just say two years later, the value of my stock is now worth a dollar. And 50% of it has vested. I would not want to be taxed as if I had received $500,000 in income because, you know, 50% of the million shares that I received have vested because I'm, I don't have any liquidity for that. Just because the shares are worth that much doesn't mean I can go sell them to pay my taxes on it or I've received any dividends or distributions or anything like that. It's what we call phantom income. And so founders that believe that their companies are going to be high scale and they're going to grow rapidly are often file an 83B election within 30 days after they receive the stock. And that protects them from the upside of having to pay taxes, right? It's not going to be a big deal if if, if you have to um, assume a dollar uh, of income, right? That's not going to put you in a new tax bracket or anything like that. That's it's it's going to be nominal how much you would pay on that in taxes, versus you know being told that you basically receive five hundred thousand dollars in income because your shares vested in the ordinary course. All right. So that is kind of that is kind of the world that we're talking about, uh, and we're talking about founders. They're at the earliest stages of the company. They're often their shares are going to be locked up, which are going to incentivize them to stick around for four years or whatever the vesting schedule says. They have a tremendous amount of tax benefits with the eighty three B election and the fact that they are receiving their shares or equity in the company at a time when the company is worth nothing. Which I always tell clients like. You should love the fact, your employees should love the fact that your company is not worth anything right now. At the very early onset, that's such a huge advantage for you to come in early with the startup when the company is worth nothing. And this is going to be another example of this. So unlike, unlike founders, employees join a company at varying stages of a corporation's development, right? Or a company's development. They might come on early. They might come on the middle stages. They might come on very, very late, depending on kind of the scale of the business, how big it gets, what the purpose is of the business. And we go back to um, our examples here, right? Laundry map versus we wash, right? Laundry map, you know, there might not be a ton of employees that are ever really going to come on because generally it's something that's kind of static, automated, 
and you know low expense. Whereas we wash, you're going to need to bring on folks, uh, sales teams, technical development folks, uh, operational folks, HR folks. You're going to have a ton of different um, employees and different people kind of assuming different roles in that type of company. So one thing that we're thinking about when we're hiring, let's call them service providers, is the distinction between contractors and employees, right? Companies generally try to put everybody in this independent contractor bucket. Why? Because the company has tax withholding Social Security, Medicare, uh, withholding requirements, at least in the U.S., as to employees. It's much more expensive to have employees than it is to have independent contractors. Um, and so that's something we'll, we'll go over that a bit in the next slide. Another thing to be thinking about similar to um, founders as independent contractors or employees, they also need to transfer over their IP rights to the company, right? Because if I am an independent contractor and I start building code or designing a logo for the business, you know, absent uh, me assigning that and saying this is the company's, uh, that's probably going to be mine, depending on the jurisdiction and the law that kind of applies. But that's just kind of the general rule there. So you want to make sure that is good because what ends up happening is you go to sell this business for $100 million. Um, there's going to be a ton of due diligence on the side. And lawyers on the, on the buyer side are going to say, all right, give me a list of every single person that has been uh, you know, a service provider, a contractor, or an employee, and let me see all their agreements. And if they don't see a transfer of assignment or assignment or transfer of IP, then they're going to say, uh, there's probably a good chance that this employee never uh, still owns the rights in this IP that we're actually buying. And so you need to go get that now. And you know what? I've, I've had this situation happen before where a company sold for a nice number and they had paid some devs in the Ukraine and the devs in the Ukraine uh, didn't sign assignments or some of them didn't assign assignments. And that one of the developers left that shop in Ukraine and couldn't be tracked down. And so we had to pay for uh, somebody to find that individual and to sign the document. And guess what happens? They see this as a leverage situation and they want to be paid. And so they want to be paid additional cash. And so we had to do that. We had to pay them additional cash for them to sign the assignment over, even though the pieces of code that they wrote were, you know, arbitrary, like they weren't that valuable by themselves. Somebody else could have written that. It was just the fact that they had written it that we needed to actually do this. Um, employees often sign, you know, non-competes and non-solicitations, depending on the nature of their work, right? And you want to probably make it very narrow for your business because a lot of jurisdictions like California and places across the world don't really uh, might frown upon non-competes and non-solicitations. So you need to be very careful on how you draft that, not making it overbroad. You don't want a salesperson to never be able to sell anything ever because that's not going to be enforceable. All right, back to my initial point, hiring employees. You're going to want to, people are trying to classify everybody as a contractor. But that's not really what matters. The law is going to look at a bunch of different factors to determine whether or not somebody is a contractor or an employee. And it doesn't matter what you say they are or that person agrees that they are, right? It's going to come down to basically a much more thorough version of the, the four-factor test that I've included here. Who controls the performance? Who says when, where, and how they work, right? Who decides that? Is it the contractor? It's a contractor who decides when, where, and how they do this, then we're leaning towards the contractor uh, being an independent contractor. If the company decides this, when they work, where they work, how they do the work, then it's going to be much more likely to be an employee. Who controls the financial reward, right? Are we paying this person a one-time price for them to get the job done? Are we paying them hourly? Is it success-driven? You know, if it's hourly, it looks a much more like an employee situation than a success fee or a fixed uh, amount that is going to be given. What is the nature of the relationship? Is it indefinite? Is the contract to say, here, you'll work for us at, you know, 40 hours a week. That's it. Or does it say you'll work for us for uh, 40 hours a week for three months? Um, that is much more when you have a term tied to a specific period of time, that looks more like an independent contractor. 
When it's indefinite, it looks like at will employment, which can be terminated at any time by either party. And I guess you can also consider how do the parties describe the relationship? The courts are not going to recognize, they're not going to just say if somebody's a 40, you know, somebody who gets paid a salary and who's subject to the control of the employer or the company uh, for an indefinite period of time is a contractor just because the contract is written as an independent contractor agreement. So that's another thing to consider. Um, one point that's not discussed here, which I get asked a lot, um, is, uh, you know, the U.S., we have minimum wage laws. And a lot of times the founders are not really taking a salary or taking any type of payment that is uh, minimum wage. But yes, founders are subject to minimum wage law, right? They need to be paid a minimum wage at least. Uh, you can't work for free in the U.S. And in most jurisdictions, you can't work for free. Now, what's going to happen? Who's the person that's going to complain about this? Well, it's going to be the founders and they're not going to, you know, blow their own whistle on, I haven't paid myself, right? That doesn't really make any sense. So that's kind of why you don't really see it ever as a, as a problem, but it does exist. Um, another thing that you think about when you're bringing on employees is, you know, startups are hard work, right? Like you're not, startup is not a culture where you're working 40 hours a week, you're, you're checking in at nine and you're leaving at five. That's just not how it goes. Um, successful startups are ones that, you know, usually people are working 60 hours a week. People are, they love doing it and they spend a ton of time doing it. Um, and so what is your obligation to pay overtime? Is there any obligation to pay overtime for employees? And so this is what we call in the, under the U.S. law, the Fair Labor Standards Act comes in. And things that you need to look at to determine whether or not somebody is entitled to overtime is how much is this the employee paid? Is their salary extremely high? Are they paid $100,000 a year? Eh, they're probably not, you know, they don't necessarily need overtime. Um, how is the employee paid? Are they paid uh, salary payments? Are they paid hourly what is the, the nature of their payment? Do any exemptions apply? Are they a class of individuals that based on their role with the company do not get overtime? There's these carve outs called executives, administrative professionals, like lawyers. Lawyers, they'll, they'll work us to death and uh, you, know, you don't get overtime, you know, you get because you're a highly compensated individual in professional services region uh, or area that is not entitled to overtime. Out, some outside sales professionals, some computer employees, technical employees are also not entitled to overtime, but it depends too on the nature of their wages and how much they're being paid. So perhaps more applicably to what you guys are looking for other than uh, you know, hearing about me ramble on about law is what do I need in an employment agreement, right? So I've decided either this person is properly an independent contractor or properly an employee. What do I need in there? You need to describe the nature of the role and expectations. You know, put your business hat on and think through the five, you know, business points that you would have. Like, what is the actual agreement between the employer and employee mean, right? What is the role? Are you going to be a sales rep? Uh, what are the expectations of being a sales rep? Are you going to be paid commission? Are you going to be expected to work um, X amount of hours a week? Um, how much will I be compensated? Will I be paid, you know, minimum wage? plus commission base for my sales. Um, and then the most important thing, arguably, is including provisions in there on confidentiality, um, assigning over any inventions or creative works that you make for the company, such as you know things that would be covered by copyright law or trademark law or patent law, and restrictions, right? Restrictive covenants on non-competes and non-solicitation. And so there's a lot of great providers out there that kind of put standard docs in place. I think Rippling is one of them. Um, that tries to cover all these things and offer letters um, and puts generic documents in place. Um, but, you know, it's still, you need to make sure that at least those three pillars, nature of the role and expectations, compensation, and then IP and restrictive covenant type things are included in the actual documents. All right, we've, we've talked about founders and the, the nature of their equity in a company. We've talked about employees and when they come on and kind of the terms of hiring and managing employees and expectations and paperwork around that. Now we're going to talk about more of the cultural aspects of startup world, right? One of the key aspects of startup world that you don't see in a lot of small businesses or even like large companies that are not tech-based is stock options. So unlike founders who receive 
receive restricted stock, so stock subject to vesting, employees often receive stock options. Stock options are not stock. Stock options are the right to buy stock in the future. They are used to acquire, retain, and incentivize talent. What does that mean? You can, a lot of times when you are, you've started a company, you can't pay a developer who normally demands a market salary uh, in Silicon Valley of $250,000 a year. You can't, you can't afford that. So what do you do? You tell them, listen, I will give you 10,000 shares of, of stock options valued at essentially nothing right now because we're a startup and you can exercise this, you know, subject to a vesting schedule of four years, the one-year cliff, like we discussed with restricted stock, stock options are usually subject to uh, vesting and you can make a ton of money because your exercise price, the price you're going to have to pay for these options is going to be nothing because the company's not worth anything today, but our company is going to grow and we're going to we're going to take over the world and we're going to sell and we're going to go public and your stock is going to be worth a ton. And so that's how you acquire talent. And then you retain talent by, you know, somebody has a great year and they get, they're getting other job offers like, hey, I could give you a raise, but we don't really, you know, have the cash. We'd rather focus our cash somewhere else. How about another, how about 20,000 more stock options? And then incentivizing talent, right? Everybody if all your employees hold stock or a meaningful amount of your employees hold stock options, they're incentivized to make the company grow. They're incentivized for the company to be successful because their financial reward is tied to the success of the business. Um, and so that's really important. It creates really cultural, a nice cultural outcome. Um, I mean, stock options are not a fix for culture. If you have a bad culture, stock options aren't gonna fix that, but they are something that incentivizes a good culture. Um, and a, kind of an important thing that I mentioned earlier, brushed through, is, is that employees that receive stock options do not own stock. That's the difference between stock options and restricted stock. Restricted stock that was granted to our founders, the founders got that stock from day one. They could vote it. They could, you know, they can't really transfer it because of securities laws and other restrictions, but um, they can vote it and they are a stockholder from that point in time, or they are a member of an LLC from that moment in time. They don't need to do anything else. The only thing is if, if they leave, they can be forced to sell their shares back for a really, really low price. Now, employees that receive stock options, they actually only receive the right to buy stock in the future. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here. Stock options are the right to buy a company stock at a fixed price in the future. So what will happen is there's a stock option award agreement, and that says you get 10,000 stock options, and the exercise price or the strike price that you pay per share is, say, one penny. So that means if I have 10,000 stock options and I vested and I want to buy them, then I can exchange my options by paying one penny per share that I want to purchase of stock. And so, um, like I said, it's often tied to vesting. Usually there's a four-year vesting schedule with a one-year cliff and employees will exercise, you know, kind of as it vests or um, each year, a portion of it that vests. Um, this strike price, the price that the employee has to pay to exercise, the exercise price, it must be fair market value when the stock options are granted. So again, that's why it's incredibly valuable to come in when a company's worth nothing because your exercise price is going to be nothing. You're going to have to pay very little to get stock in, you know, in the future once it's best. In the U.S., this determination of fair market value is done under what's called a 409A valuation. You see um, companies like Carta now offering 409A valuations as a part of their services that you can get each year to kind of tell you what the value of the stock is. And this is an exciting time for employees. I, I always think it's fun when the uh, 409A valuation comes out and they can see, you know, the shares, their stock options that they're granted at a penny now being valued by a 409A valuator at a dollar. They're like, wow, look at how much we've grown. Um and so as the company grows, the fair market value should go up uh, and the employees can be much more incentivized to exercise their options and want to become a stockholder. Let's look at this and this is kind of like a, a venture backed outcome type situation, right? Here's the different points in time. Uh, here's a value of the overall business, right? And so the stock price is some type of derivative uh, of the amount of shares that exist uh, divided by the amount or 
the amount of the value of the company as a whole divided by the amount of shares that exist um, to figure out what the, the value of the individual one share would be. And so, you know, as your value of your company goes up, you know, so does the value of your shares, right? Until you get here. And so if you you received your stock options at this point in time, and now you're right here, you're looking like you're in the money there. Um, so let's let's do some examples of kind of what we've learned so far. So Ed employee received 5,000 options at a strike price of a dollar per share on December 1st, 2021, subject to a four-year vesting schedule with a one-year cliff. <clears throat> um, first question, can you exercise your options today? So it's been one year and it's got a one-year cliff. This video is being recorded. I don't know what day it is. It's December 9th or something. I'm not sure. That's probably not the best look. It is December 7th. <laughs> um, so it's been one year. So yes, I can exercise some of my options. How many shares can I buy? Well, I've got 5,000 and it's a one-year cliff. So 25% of them will vest. So that is uh, 1,250. Uh, how much will you get to pay? Well, I'm exercising 1,250 and my strike price is a dollar. So I'm gonna have to pay $1,250. Can I sell those shares now? So let's look at these questions. Yes, that was right. This was right. The price was right. Can I sell my shares? This depends on the nature of the company. If the company is a publicly traded company, then yes, you could sell them into the market. If the company is a private company that's not public, it's probably very unlikely that you can sell the shares. There's not a liquidity event. The shares can't just be sold to anybody. There's restrictions on that under law and also probably under the award agreements that say you cannot do this. Um, but if the company sold, then you could, right? If the company sold to a, a buyer, then you could sell your shares to that buyer or would be entitled to the proceeds of the sale based on how much of the company that you own. Um, so why would I exercise my options? I can't sell them right? Like why would I exercise my options? Well, you're going to exercise your options when you perceive the value of the company has gone up, right? If your company has gone up and you can exercise at a penny a share, and now you know the value of it's a dollar a share, you might say, well, we're pretty likely to go public at some point or sell. And so the value of this makes sense for me to spend this money now to uh, exercise my options. You want to vote on certain matters, right? When you just hold options, you don't have the right to vote. You're not a stockholder. But maybe you want to vote. Maybe you want to say, like, who should be on the board and vote on certain decisions that you're, that stockholders are entitled to vote on. There's also tax and regulatory benefits associated with exercising your options. Generally, there's regulatory uh, allowances that allow someone to sell private shares in what's called a secondary market if they've held those shares for a certain period of time. Let's go over this regulatory framework just real quick. So the, the, the two laws that apply, at least in the U.S., that you're looking at is, you know, the IRS and the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. They uh, require that stock options be awarded under what's called a stock plan, which is this document that has to be adopted by the board and the shareholders of a company. And it basically reserves X amount of shares to be given out to employees as options. Um you know, as far as options, you have tax obligations, like what are your payment, tax payment obligations when you receive your shares, when you exercise your shares, and when you sell your shares. That's the regulatory framework that we're looking at. And then limitations on secondary sales, your ability to sell options that you just received uh, and exercise to somebody else. Are you limited by law to do that? Is the SEC limiting you and your ability to sell shares? Um, so here's some frequently asked questions I get asked about stock options in particular. Who determines the amount of stock options in the strike price? This is one who determines the amount is usually the board, right? If you are in an AC corp, usually the board is who controls the company. And this could just be, you know, the three founders, right? That are the sole members of the board and they could determine the amount of options that somebody gets. Um, and they would probably 
engage a valuation specialist to tell you what the 409A valuation price is for your options. Where can I see my stock options? Most people, uh, they either have like their attorneys retain um, a cap table showing who owns what. Most people nowadays you work with Carta um, that keeps track of their options. How do you exercise your options? Generally, it kind of differs, but there's normally a few different options. You could pay the exercise price in cash, or you could do something called a net exercise, right? You would basically say like, it's it cost me a penny to exercise these options. Instead of giving you a penny, let's reduce my number of shares that would account for me not paying a penny. Um, it's called a net exercise. What types of things do I get to vote on? If you are a stockholder, well, I get a vote on who's who's involved in the board. If the company is going to sell the company or merge with another business, you might be entitled to a vote there. And there's other specific things that might be granted in the governing documents. Um, just to kind of loop back to one more point here, um, because I don't want to. I focus mostly on stock options because I think conceptually that is the easiest way to understand. Uh, but stock options are generally only for uh, corporations, right? Like arguably you can do that type of mechanic with an LLC or some type of um, other type of like pass-through or partnership tax entity. Um, but usually what you see in, a, in an LLC is something that's very similar to stock options, but there's called profits interests. And this isn't a distribution of profits. Um, I don't really like the name profits interest because I don't think it's very descriptive of what it actually is. But here's the concept that I will will give you. Um, founders, one founder started a company and the company was worth $1 million. Instead, uh, if he gave, he or she gave 10% um, to a new co-founder, they would essentially be giving that co-founder $100,000 essentially, right? Or in value, right? Because I've already built a million dollar business and I'm giving you 10% for nothing basically. And so if we liquidated the business today and sold it for a million dollars, the 10% owner would get $100,000 and I would only get $900,000. That's not fair, right? So there's this concept called profits interests, what basic, which basically says is, Instead of you getting membership interest in rights to value that I've already created, you get 10% of the future value that you help create, right? So let's say it was worth a million dollars. I gave away 10% in profits interest, and then the company sells a year later for $10 million. What that means is that me as the original founder, I'm going to get the first $1 million back. I get the first $1 million. My new co-founder who gets uh, 10% is only going to get 10% of the $9 million, right? And I'm going to get 90% of the $9 million in addition to the million dollars I got back. That's called profits interest. You see that often um, in an LLC, it's complicated, it's difficult to manage, it's difficult to comprehend and understand because you still need to get a valuation and understand the growth that has happened. Um, and so it's not nearly as prominent. Uh, stock options. And that's kind of why you see most um, technology companies organized as corporations, specifically C corporations, because options are easy in that situation. Um, and uh, people understand them a lot better, but you do have a similar framework um, working with an LLC. So that is kind of what we discussed today. Um, you know, if you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot them to me um, by email or set a, set a time to chat on a Calendly. But I want to give you kind of an overview of how it looks to bring in founders, how it looks to bring in um, employees and, and different ways that you can do that and manage that. So hopefully you found uh, this helpful. Awesome. And and Shane, that was that was that was great, man. Had had a couple of questions that we wanted to to, to tag on yeah. to the end of it just as, as you were going through that. Yeah. Um where's just before we do that, what's wh where is the best place for, for people to go? So anyone watching this video, um, is it to reach out via email? Is it to contact you through your website? Like where would you like people to go next if they wanna need your help with something? Um yeah, I can probably send you guys after my mm -hmm. uh email address and my calendly link. 
Okay. Um, I think we have a Calendly link to just like our general 15 minute thing on our website on jutolaw.com. Yep. Um, it's a good place, but email is probably the best. Perfect. Perfect. And so, so, so a couple of quick questions. Um, if you went down the, the LLC path and you, you wanted to set up that profits interests, um, is it still a 409A valuation or is it a different kind of valuation that needs to get done for that, that sort of entity? It's, it's very similar. Okay. Um, and it's going to be a similar process. It just, I, it might have a different name, um, to it. A lot of times people don't treat it as, uh, as buttoned up as mm. they do with um usually there's an agreed upon value between the two people it's okay. kind of how often i see it and it's not as prominent as the stock options but it's very similar you would hire a val valuation company to come in and tell you what the price of the company is worth today gotcha, gotcha. and then you would use that price as the basis okay fantastic and then so so second question um, so one, one model that I've seen that's, that's kind of interesting or that, 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 that has popped up a little bit is where, um, someone will set up a business. Um, it might not even be a tech company. So, so we've had quite a few people that start off as a, an agency or a service business or something like that, okay. then use that revenue to bootstrap, uh, a SaaS business or a technology play. Um, and then that starts taking off and they gradually shut down the, the service business and switch everything over hundred percent into the tech company. Um, I've also seen a situation where, um, uh, a company will start off bootstrapping for a while and then something will happen. Maybe they, you know, there's a, a big competitor enters the, enters the market. Um, and they, they think, oh, okay, maybe we need to go down the VC path and raise some money now to be able to, to compete. Um, or maybe they pivot the business and realize actually with this new business model, we need a lot more money to be able to make this work. Um, and so for whatever reason, they, they started off in a, in a bootstrappable, <laughs> to, to, yeah. to borrow your phrase, uh, a bootstrappable model. And they might not have been thinking about uh, setting it up, uh, setting up stock options, setting up um, everything like that from the beginning. Um, how, how, how difficult is it? So if you set up a company and it's generating revenue and, and uh, but you set it up as an LLC or something like that, how difficult is it uh, if you do want to then decide to, to take on venture capital to restructure things? And how does that affect the, the 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 vesting schedule say you've been running that for two years and then you now decide you want to raise capital um does it does it reset the vesting schedules um do you need to set up a new company and acquire the old company um sure. is the equity now sorry i'm throwing a lot of questions out is the, is the equity oh, now, you're fine. now worth zero dollars again or you know 0. 0.00001 um like how how does that how do you handle that situation as a founder <clears throat> yeah so generally speaking you would do what's called a conversion if you're going to convert to, say, a Georgia, state of Georgia LLC to a Delaware C Corp, you would file what's called a certificate of conversion, certificate mm -hmm. of incorporation, basically telling Delaware, hey, I'm changing from a Georgia LLC to a Delaware corporation. Okay. States have different rules, right? So some states won't allow you to do a conversion. Sometimes, sometimes they'll call it a domestication. That's a good question, too. I'll answer. Um, so some come a re-domestication. Some of them, like I think I have do New Mexico, where we had to form a new Delaware company and then merge the New Mexico LLC into the Delaware company, and the Delaware company survives and lives on. Um, so that's the first way. It's usually called a conversion, maybe a merger, maybe a re-domestication, uh, depending on the states that are involved. And that's it's not incredibly difficult, but it's probably beyond an ordinary person's ability not like filing an LLC is easy you can go online just figure it out right especially if you're the only owner it's much more difficult for a conversion there um as far as what happens with your equity beforehand generally it carries over now you can be very smart and lawyerly about this if i formed an llc before and i didn't file an 83b but now i'm in a, a c corp now then I would say I'm subject to vesting now and I want to file an 83B now that I'm in a C Corp and I want to be taxed on the value of this today. Or potentially you could probably try to revert back to the value when you initially received it. But I think it's tied to the value, the better argument it's tied to the value when you initially, or uh, now when you're imposing this uh, vesting schedule on it. So that's kind of the point there. So I think the, the best place is always to put yourself in an 83B if you expect the value to go up. I mean, 
I can't think of why you wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, but that does mean imposing yourself and subjecting yourself to vesting early on. But at the end of the day, I mean, vesting isn't a problem, right? As long mm -hmm. as you're going to stay with the company until it folds or succeeds, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there were some other questions kind of built in there. Um, I think I think that has it. Um, yeah, the valuation would probably stick over and would still apply because it's basically the same thing, just in a different form. Right. Um, to to Sonny's question in the thing, what about QSBS, which is qualified small business stock? So qualified small business stock starts when you're in a corporation, right? So the date of your holding period would start um, when you uh, are a corporation. And so just an overview of QSBS. QSBS is a significant U.S. tax break for founders and for investors that invest in technology corporations, basically, um, that allows them to basically get the tax free on exit, right? It's, I think the cap's like 10 times the amount that you paid for it or up to $10 million. It's a little bit trickier, um, but that's generally the idea is that you can get a huge windfall and tax break, right? If you're you, you received on exit $10 million back, you might not have to pay any taxes on that, which is pretty wild and, and a pretty good incentive for, um, you know, founders and investors. Um, oh, and, and your situation, I think another question that's kind of built into what you're contemplating there too, is like, there are so many different ways. Like if you're a service provider business and you want to start um, like a SaaS platform on the side, like, even if you're just an LLC, like create a second LLC and mm -hmm. have it owned by the LLC that you own. Like that's called like a, a parent subsidiary relationship. And that way you can, you know, have your services side of it and you can have your software side of it. You could sell your software side of it mm -hmm. and keep your services side of it. Right. Um, that's another way you can do it. There's, there's all sorts of different structures that you could do. Um, a lot of times you'll see maybe like a, like a, a corporation style company, a venture style company maybe create like multiple branches of a business so they'll have a corporation up top then an llc that does this and an llc that does that i think sometimes it can be overkill and it's kind of pointless but other times it's nice if you suspect like selling off this portion of it instead of this mm -hmm. other portion of it and and final question um is there so so with with preferential shares um where do 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 employee stock options do so do they vote do they get preference like how how does that kind of work with with employee stock options so employee stock options are usually options to buy common stock which is what right. a founder gets right um so preferred stock is generally what an investor gets and that gives them certain rights that are better than the common stock right so the most Common ones are, you can think of in two different piles, economic and then governance, right? So yeah. economic, right? They might have the right, what's called a liquidation preference. If if mm -hmm. the company sells, I get my money back first. Right. If there's not enough money to pay everybody out, I get paid. That's my liquidation preference. Also, if you sell preferred shares to another investor at a price that's cheaper than mine, I get anti-dilution protection, mm -hmm. basically saying I get to adjust the amount of preferred stock that I have because you gave this out at a cheaper price. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the, the the big economic rights that are related to preferred stock um, as opposed to common stock. Then you also have governance type rights, right? So like rights that are related to being designating a, a specific seat on the board to the preferred mm -hmm. stockholders or granting certain veto rights. Like you can't sell the company without 51% uh, mm. thumbs up from the preferred stockholders or take a loan out for this month. So it's much more mm. restrictions on, on that, but employee stock options almost always 99.9% .9 of the time are going to be options to buy common stock. Mm. 